about to watch contains riots, ruthless police tactics, and unimaginable poverty. But what sets this film apart from others that we've made is that by the time we completed it, several of the contributors had been brutally murdered. Live from the Sky News Center, this is Sky News with Chris Roberts. Hello there, top story at six. Despite international calls for calm, the situation in Kenya seems to be worsening by the hour. Hundreds of people, including women and children, have been killed in explosive riots across Kenya. Thousands of British holidaymakers in the country are being advised to stay indoors following widespread violence and looting. The tribal violence broke out after Merway Kabaki won the presidential election, a vote that many of his opponents say was rigged. After six years in government, President Kabaki was expected to lose the December 2007 election. His disputed win plunged the country into violence that left 1,500 dead and a quarter of a million people displaced and Kenya on the brink of civil war. Go for it down there. We're here to investigate an organization that comes with a fearsome reputation and is accused of being behind much of the inter-tribal violence. Right, get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. Okay, I'll hear firsthand about the brutal murders committed in the slums. His head en ended up there. I will learn about the extent of their threats. Mabasa and Dore to Lamu everywhere will burn these houses to hell. And I'll be in Nairobi when they attempt to bring Kenya to a standstill. I've come to Kenya to meet a secret sect known as the Monkiki. They claim to have over four million members and are said to have been behind much of the post-election violence that claimed over a thousand lives here. They're also accused of running protection rackets worth millions of shillings and of torturing and decapitating their enemies. It's four months since the election and the two main political parties here are still at loggerheads over who ultimately controls this country. The political uncertainty, the corruption and the tribal violence makes this the perfect environment for the Mongiki to thrive. The parts of the country I'm visiting bear no resemblance to the vision of safaris and tropical beaches that most people have of Kenya. Decades of corruption have kept the ruling elite enormously wealthy and the majority abysmally poor. Three quarters of the urban population live in huge lawless ghettos and 56% of all Kenyans have to survive on less than a dollar a day. It's said that the Mongiki control most of Nairobi's sprawling slums, and that is where I start my investigation. They are accused of preying on the poorest by taking over the slums and setting up huge extortion rackets and brutally stamping on anyone that challenges their rule. There are communities that live in constant fear of the Mongiki threat. That name Mungiki. Yeah. That Mungiki. What does it mean to you? Uh, that can make you afraid. They are coming in large number. And uh, if they reach you, they will kill you. They could just come and slash you to death, believing that if they can kill 10 people, 100 people will be scared. The Mungiki have a reputation for using beheadings, skinning, and dismemberment as their chosen methods of execution. Killing him is not enough for the Mongiki. They need to send a message. And that message doesn't come with just shooting somebody. They, they do decapitate people. They, they, they skin people as well, don't they? They do, you know. And that is not just killing somebody. You know, that, is, that is ritualistic. That is actually, yeah. yes, that is torture. And, and I compare Mongiki to terrorists because terrorists do very grotesque things and they make the people live in dread. The Mungiki claim to have millions of members, 
but it's impossible to know the exact numbers as the organization is shrouded in secrecy. We thought gaining access to them would be difficult, but after only being in Kenya for 36 hours, we hear of a serious standoff between the Mungiki and the police. Are they dead? No, they're not dead. The Nairobi suburb of Kaioli is a Mungiki stronghold. Yesterday, an angry mob laid siege to a police station holding a Mungiki suspect and forced the police to release him. Today, we get a call to say that in reprisal, hundreds of police are pouring into Kaioli, clearing the streets and searching for Mungiki. And you can see around us, police have just cleared the streets. People are upstairs um, on the rafters on the roof, all looking down. People have got guns, as you can see now, on my left. They're undercover cops, and they've got AK-47s. <laughs> Interesting. Gunfire down there. <laughs> the police are closing off whole areas to search for anyone they think may be connected to the outlawed organization. Afternoon, can you talk to us? Can you talk to us to tell us what's going on? Is that a no? They're loading people up. Well, I'm not sure whether they were the protesters or not, but they've certainly been uh, rounded up and they've been taken off uh, for questioning or, or whatever happens here. I try to find out exactly what's going on. Gentlemen, eh? I'm on duty and, and you please go away. Who are you first of all? We're from Sky Television, London, England. What are you doing here? We're filming what's going on here. You go home. This is our internal problem here. Okay, thank you. Told to go home. Soon the police are reinforced by the GSU, the General Service Unit. They are the government's elite riot squad. They are a scary bunch, I have to say. Something going on. Guys, the tour is done. Let's go. Got someone. Just arrested someone there. The shot's going off. This has all resulted as uh, of the Mongiki guy being released. Um, the police have come back with uh, with a vengeance. What are we doing? Just kill me. Let them kill me. These guys have got dreads, they've got classic uh, Mongiki uh, haircuts. A lot of them shave them off nowadays. Uh, so rocks are being thrown, look. Rocks over there, just land. You right, you right? Yeah, it's alright, it's alright. It's out of nowhere, a lot of people started throwing stones down this alleyway. Um, no, wait, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. It's tear gas, actually. Is it? Uh, just got the drift of the tear gas in the wind. We're actually in the wind now. You're going to start getting it. So we're going to move, move out of the way of it. After yesterday's humiliation, the police are keen to reassert their authority.
this lot turned up in force. Uh, it smacks off to me, it's just simple retaliation. You know, one Mongeki was released yesterday, they've come back in here to show who's boss, and uh, they've certainly done that. 24 hours after the riots, the Mongeki agreed to meet us, but only on their terms. I'm in Kenya, just weeks after some of the worst violence the country has ever seen. I'm trying to meet the Mongiki, a secretive sect said to be behind much of the recent bloodshed. The majority of the Mongiki are from the Kikuyu tribe, and beheading their enemies is a tribal tradition. From the Cathedral of the Highlands in Nairobi are born the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Roger Ruck and their six-year-old son, Michael. A British family brutally murdered by the Mau Mau. The Mau Mau used decapitation as a fear tactic against the British in the 1950s during their struggle for independence. And it's said the Mungiki have copied the terror tactics of their Kikuyu ancestors. Yesterday I watched the police round up suspects in the Mungiki controlled area. Word has obviously got around that we're here because today I get a call. Uh, when we first arrived here, we had no idea how much access we'd get to a secret organisation like the Mongiki. Um, our best hopes that we'd get to speak to foot soldiers. Well, out of the blue, we've been offered an interview with the three top members of the Mongiki. Um, going to a, a location some way out of Nairobi, and obviously we're a little bit worried about what's going to happen when we get there. They want to meet at the deserted home of their imprisoned founder, Minor and Jenga, currently serving five years for the possession of drugs and firearms. The Mongiki claim it was a setup by the authorities. We've clearly been observed on our approach to the house, and now I'm left waiting for the Mongiki leaders for what seems like an eternity. Good afternoon. Hi, Ross Kemp, pleased to meet you. Hello, gentlemen. Pleased to meet you, Ross Kemp. How are you? How are you? Pleased to meet you. How are you? You well? Thank you for agreeing to meet us. You know about the publicity that you're given. We've heard that you, you cut people's heads off, that you skin people's yeah. skulls, that you dismember their bodies and leave them in different areas. How do you answer those accusations? They are all very good uh, fabrications from the state machinery, especially during the Kibaki era. Before that, there was not a lot of negative propaganda. After they saw the growth of the movement, they started bringing in fear in between. Okay? And what they did first is they started attacking our members, killing them. Hey, this is the police. This is the police. They took two people. There were two people, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, they killed one, they beheaded one, placed his head somewhere in Nairobi. So you were accused of the beheadings that they, yeah, that yeah. you say they committed. And at least uh, we can say the fear that the government propagated has really worked. But it's not us who do anything. The Mongiki originated as a spiritual group in the 1980s around the prophecies of their charismatic leader, Minor Njenga. He encouraged a return to a more fundamental Kikuyu way of life. The word Mongiki means multitude, and by 2002, they were a million strong. And the sheer weight of numbers meant the Mongiki became a political force and a political threat. They were criminalized by the government in 2003, and at this point, their objectives changed. They started taking control of the slums, and it's here that they are reputed to extort millions and rule with an iron fist. You, as an organization, control or run a lot of the slums, is that true? 
Mm -hmm. Very true. But there must have been gangs inside those slums that weren't happy about you turning up. Yeah, we changed, oh, we changed those, them. those rude boys. Come we on, first on. changed those people. And, and how did you persuade him? <laughs> no, give him reality. Give him reality and give him hope. hope. But if, he, if he probably only understands violence, how do you deal with someone that only understands violence? First change his, uh, his mental uh, perspective mm -hmm. to life. He should not just be violent, you know. He should think about his future. The original philosophy of the movement is one of unity, self-sacrifice and power in numbers. The Kikuyu are Kenya's biggest tribe and the Mongiki are seen as the group that stands up for the ordinary rank and file Kikuyu. Members can be identified by their continual use of snuff, but as a group they are strenuously opposed to drugs and alcohol and all symbols of Western decadence. Is it right that you levy taxes on the people inside the slums? No, we assist one another. We don't levy taxes. Uh, uh, can they, you they, explain they, to me the difference? They all know. They all know that we, we all have a sort of like a common problem. You know, the poverty is common all through. So they need sort of like something like a welfare system that the government did not create for them. So, so the and people create for themselves. And you organize Yes, that. we help them in the organization. The youth of this country have been reduced to almost nothing. We have a lot, lot, lot of problems everywhere. Well, corruption no seems to be endemic inside this country. Corruption is everywhere. Yeah, Kenya is not yet free. A country of 10 million years and 10 million Bear poor us. people. Just came out of my meeting with the Monkiki and I have to say I'm probably more confused now than when I went in there. I've been led to believe that they were extortionists, that they killed people, cut their heads off. But nearly every question that I laid at their feet, they seemed to have a pretty convincing answer. I still don't believe that they're the saints they paint themselves to be. They, they can't be. Uh, you know, that old saying, there's no smoke without fire. Um, it looks like we're going to have to ask a lot more questions uh, until we find out exactly what's going on here. One thing I do know about Kenya is the huge gap between the rich and the poor. Ever since Kenya won its independence from the British, the wealth and power of the nation has been divided up between a small group of the political elite, leaving the vast majority of the population in abject poverty. Perhaps this explains the rapid rise of the Mungiki, who claim to represent the millions who feel they have been ignored by successive governments. The next day, I get another call from the Mongiki leaders. The Mongiki hierarchy have invited us into one of the communities that they control to show us the good works that they do. Uh, this is Dandora, one of the most toxic places on earth. It's the landfill site for the city of Nairobi. Uh, since we arrived here, people have been coming up to us in droves telling us how much the area has changed since the Mongiki took over. There used to be gangs that would basically take money off the people that work the tips here. Um, since the Mongiki arrived, uh, those gangs have been moved off. They have protection uh, and they're looked after. I have to say, to me, it looks like hell on earth. The Dandora dump may well be hell on earth, but thousands of people managed to scrape a living by sifting through the rotting waste in 40 degree heat. Stephen, can you tell me a little bit about how you managed to take control of this, of this area? Uh, it's uh, quite a lot of work that has been doing consistently for a long time. We started with uh, one person, you go recruiting uh, uh, the other, talking to, to them, you teach them about to stop bad behaviours. How can you recruit someone who is, is in charge of that area, if he's the gang guy that controls the area? First of all, you know, within the, the message that you are pre preaching, there is a divine call. So, uh, some things just happens miraculously, unless you are... Well, it was a miracle. It's a, you can see it like a miracle, because uh, if at all... I find that hard to believe. I'm a cynic, though. You are cynic. Then, uh, let's say it's a lot of work that is being doing, yeah. that is being done with the help of the community, within the people who surround them. 
the Mongiki take me deeper into the vast dump to explain to me how they run the site. How does the finance work then? How does the money be collected? So, to say this is sold... Like, like, like this one now, like this one, uh, one kilo is uh, 10 shillings. One kilo is 10, one killing of plastic is 10 shillings. Uh, 10 shillings. So if you have a thousand kilogram, then... Uh, you have more shillings. You have more shillings. And within the whole Kenya, mm. uh, you collect uh, 55,000 55, tons of plastics uh, daily. So if you manage to collect a half, then that's a lot of money. People here earn around 50 pence for a full day's work. I want to understand about how, how the actual community is run and how you police it and organize it. Uh, we organize uh, people into cells. And one cell is uh, a cell of 10 people. And every group gives to the other group. So they help one another. Yeah, but there is a security inside that and that comes from you guys, yeah? Yeah. Stephen has set up a meeting with a group of Mongiki converts. So everyone here is a Mongiki member, yeah? Yes. When they were, when they before the Mongiki, were they earning more money or less money? Yes. money. Uh, he's saying that right now they are gaining now, they are getting money. money but and it's in English, go on, say it. We used to get money, but the money we get, we use it with uh, data bread, with drinking, alcohol, drug abuse. Yeah, I'm strong now <laughs> in Mongiki. <laughs> Why do, the, why do the press continuously say that Mongiki are responsible for decapitations and killing people? When, when you write an article about Mongiki will sell well, let me tell you, in the Kenyan newspaper, there won't be a copy that won't be bought. People want to know more about Mongiki. Mongiki is a mystery to Kenyans themselves. So all those, all those stories, all the things in the newspaper... In December, the government was killing youths around this place. They formed this unit... Is that true? Yeah. 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 Yes. For nothing in fact. I just kill people in just for believing, nothing. you know? For being members of Mungiki, you are taken, you are slaughtered. You know, that's what they do. The government does engage into mafia tactical activities. The, the government is an organized gang. But that's what they say, that's what they cause the Mungiki of being. Organized crime. That's what they say. I came to disagree with that. We have come to believe that the government is killing us. They are fighting us, they are crushing us because of fear. And why are they scared? It has come a situation whereby the, the most neglected people in the society, they have now started arising and realizing that togetherness, they can do something. Mongiki offer the people here security, food, uh, somewhere to live, and most importantly, hope. Uh, I have to say, most of the people that were doing the talking were well dressed and in suits, and most of the people doing the listening were the workers. Though the ones that I did speak to seemed honestly happy with having the Mongiki as their masters rather than their past masters who were the government and the gangs. A quarter of a million people live next door to this highly polluted dump. Dandora Town was built in the 1970s with World Bank money and quickly became notorious for violence and crime. The Mongiki say that since they took control of this area, crime levels have dropped. They've arranged for me to meet Tony. His story is typical of many young Mongiki and He's fully on message. I have no parents. Yeah. My father died in bomb blast. The American embassy bomb blast, uh, yeah? Yeah. I ran away from home. I so you go on the street with the street gangs, yeah? Yeah, I meet with them. Pickpocking? Yeah, yeah pickpocking. I take glue, drunks. The policeman put me inside for six months. You're in prison for six months? Yeah, yeah? in prison for six months. How old are you then? 15. You were 15, you yeah. went to prison for six months? Yeah, yeah, 15. Yeah. How did the Mongiki come into your life? How did that happen? I ran to them. Mm. They welcomed me. Yeah, and they taught you? Yeah. So, Tony, can you tell me a little bit about what your actual job is inside the Mongiki? What do you do? 
get people together. Teach them how to stop stealing, to stop drinking, to stop using drugs. But how do you do that? We teach them to believe one God, but no other God. We are talking with them with mouth. What about the violence that the, um, the, the, the Mungiki are accused of? Have you ever seen any of that? Nothing. There is no thing like that. I feel like I've been in a bit of a Mungiki public relations tour. So we decide to slip off and talk to some other people from Dandora town. What's it like? Is it peaceful around here? Uh-huh. Yeah, Is it yeah, peaceful? There's peace here. You see, people are doing their own businesses. Yeah? There has been trouble here, hasn't there, or not? Uh, it, it was not this area. It was... Uh, over there, yeah? Yeah, over there. Here, it was very calm. Are there any Mongeki here? Yeah, there are very many here. Yeah? Maybe I'm one of them. Are you? <laughs> Oh, you tell me, you tell me. I'm not one of them, but they're very many. Are they good people? Yeah, they're good people. Everybody gives them a bad press. Why does everyone give them a bad press? They always rage when uh, they are attacked. That's why they are, they are said to be bad. But yeah. they are good people. <laughs> this is turning out to be a very different film from the film that I think we all thought we were going to make when we first arrived here. We came here to, to look at a sect come gang called the Mongiki. Um, and we were told that they, you know, regularly behead people, that they are vicious. Um, and I don't know even at this moment whether that's true or not. When I met the leaders, uh, they were, you know, they were a slick outfit. They were very convincing. Every question I asked them in terms of their of the murdering, of the beheadings. They all said that they were, you know, plots by the government to disable them as an organization. One thing's for sure, they are highly organized. Um, um, what they've done is something that this government seems to have failed to have done, which has galvanized the poor here. Um, I'm sure also they take money off them, undoubtedly, to support their organization and to feather their own pockets. I can't prove that, but that's what I suspect. You know, this country uh, has that classic dilemma of, you know, a few people ultimately controlling everything. Uh, and the poverty is just shocking. I think we're at a very important time in, 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 in modern Kenya's history in terms of, you know, this place doesn't seem very far away from a revolution of some kind. Next, I travel north to meet a community that have been forgotten by everybody and have only one way of making it through each day. When did you start taking glue? I've come to Kenya to uncover an organization called the Mongiki. They stand accused of horrific violence and massive extortion. I'm here at a time when the country is still reeling from the tribal violence sparked by the recent general election. The ruling president, President Kibaki, is from the Kikuyu tribe. And when he appeared to steal the election from the opposition, it was the catalyst for all of Kenya's tribes to rise up against the Kikuyu and settle old scores. Overnight, people were burnt out of their homes and hundreds were murdered. The violence claimed the lives of over a thousand men, women and children and left a quarter of a million people homeless. What you have seen actually defies description. We can only describe it as genocide. I'm driving to Eldoret in the Rift Valley a town that witnessed much of the post-election violence. At the height of the troubles, it was reported that armed Mongiki were being bussed into the area and used as a militia to defend the Kikuyu people. Matthews, can you tell me exactly what happened here after the election? Immediately after the results were announced, there was a, an abrupt eruption of violence. Yeah. We saw people being chopped off the heads. 
beheaded. Yeah, she saw beheaded, that happen. Yes, yeah? they were hacking so, each other. This you, happened even outside my own house where I stayed. Inside your own house? Yes. One of the accusations that we've heard is that the Mongiki were driven in here and told people, we're coming in tomorrow, if you're not gone, we're going to kill you. Have you ever heard anything? Yeah, there were those complaints from the local community that, that they had seen people being brought in using lorries yeah. from the other direction, Nairobi direction. Yeah. And these people were heavily armed. But were these people Mongiki or were they just Kikuyu tribesmen? Okay, most of them were Kikuyu tribesmen, but it is believed that some of them were Mungik indeed, considering the kind of killings which were witnessed, like the chopping off of heads of people, yeah. chopping off of uh, private parts. Private parts, yeah. Yes, and displaying them publicly. Yeah. Once again, there appears to be plenty of rumors implicating the Mongiki in violence, but very little concrete evidence. The fact is that hundreds of people were killed and thousands driven out of areas that have been their homes for decades. This is Eldoret showground. Since the post-election violence, it's become an internally displaced persons camp. There are over 150 similar camps like this one in Kenya, home to some of the 300,000 displaced people. And it just goes on forever. How many people are actually living here? Here in a little showground, yeah. we have more than 15,000 people. 15,000 people? Yeah. Thousand. And they're all Kikuyu, yeah? Most, most of the people that have been affected are Kikuyus. The government has assured the people here that it is safe to return home. However, they are too frightened to leave the security of the IDP camp. While I've been in Kenya, I've seen some appalling examples of poverty. But there's always been a glimmer of hope. Here in Eldoret, I meet a glue community who seem to be at the very bottom of the human pile. We're in downtown Eldoret. We've come to meet the glue kids. Uh, these kids are addicted to solvents. And they're just some of the 350,000 kids that are homeless in Kenya. With the post-election violence, parents being killed or displaced, that number is expected to increase dramatically. I've witnessed many things on my travels, but I was truly horrified by what was happening around me. We just arrived, we were setting up, and what I wasn't prepared for was the fact that there are obviously young girls here that have children in part of this glue community. One of the most shocking things I think I've ever seen in my life is the mothers who are heavily addicted to giving the glue bottle to their toddlers. What's your name? Alex, yeah? And how old are you? You're 11 years old, yeah? Yes. And how long have you been on the street? Two years. Two years. And why did you end up here? My mother is in here. Yeah. Well, she Drunk. takes glue or drink? Drunk. Alcohol? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and when did you start taking glue? When you came here? One year. One year? Yes. Is it good? Do you want to keep doing it? No. But why do you do it? It hurts your chest? Yes. Would you like to leave the streets? What would you like to do? What would you like to do in the future? To go to school. To go to school? Yes. Where are your parents? My name is Parents. Your parents are dead? Yes. How did they die? 
Clashes. 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 The clashes between the tribes, yeah? Yes. What tribe are you? Kikuyu. The Kikuyus, yeah? Kikuyu. Would you like to get out of here? Yes, I want to leave. What would you like to do? I want to go to school. To school to do what? <laughs> While I'm still unsure of the Mungiki's methods, I can't help thinking that any order in this place would be better than nothing at all. I'm back in Nairobi. During my time here, I've heard so many half-truths and rumours that I'm desperate to meet someone who will speak objectively about what's really going on. I've arranged a meeting with the chairman of the Kenyan National Commission on Human Rights, Mina Kaye. In this country, there are really just two tribes, the rich and the, and the poor. That disparity between haves and have-nots, which yes. is so great here. Absolutely. No one has ever catered for that. The have not. No, in, nobody has. Go government and politicians talk the talk, they never walk it. We have a group of greedy uh, leaders, and that therefore means you find security and everything else by the, by the government stays with the rich and not with the poor. This Mungiki, um, this organization, offers hope where there is none. They, they also not only just hope, they also offer jobs. Yeah. Because they give, yeah, they give unemployed people Dandora, something saw, to do. Absolutely. That. They give you know, people who are not employed, who can't get employment, have something to do. One thing they've said to us, that they're, they're not responsible for any of the beheadings that you see in the, in the press. They say it was down to the Kwekwe, the secret police. I, I mean, I, I don't know. There's no, there's no evidence to, to pinpoint Mung, Mungiki for the beheadings, although that's the common assumption that's made in this country. The other thing that's happened with Mungiki, as, as, as soon as became a, a reviled group in the country, then el, almost every single major criminal activity, the police would say it's Mungiki. So you, you'd find even non-Mungiki people extorting on the basis that they are Mungiki, even though they're not Mungiki. So Mungiki became... And when they're a secret organization, it's easy to say, I'm one or I'm not one. Absolutely. What, what about this thing about the Kwe Kwe? Do these, do these secret policemen exist that go around killing people? Oh, absolutely. There, yes, there they are do. Death squads here. Oh, yes, they are. I mean, last year, we, we documented at this commission about 500 bodies that had been found dead and they'd all been shot. Just the other day, I got a policeman coming to see me, telling me about a new squad that's been formed that's killing people. But this time, they're not shooting. This time they are hanging, or they, are, or they cut you off with a machete, and so they are moving away now from the shootings, because the shootings point easily to the, towards the police. Minor, can you just tell me, what do you actually think about Mungiki? I think that any group that is secret is a danger to society. And I think if you can't speak out openly, if we can't know who Mungiki is for sure, then it will remain a dangerous outfit. <laughs> According to Miner, the Mongiki are not telling me the whole truth, and I'm still not sure what danger they pose or what their ultimate goals are. Later, I get a call from the Mongiki leadership. They want me to join them and 60 new recruits in the Central Highlands for a clandestine ceremony. So far, we've been given unprecedented access by the Mongiki. They've allowed us into the slums, uh, allowed us to film their projects, and to speak to their members, albeit under their watchful eye. Now they've invited us down to their spiritual homeland to film uh, an initiation ceremony. It's the first time they've allowed anyone to do this. The ceremony takes place in Mongiki heartland, high up in the central highlands, where the sect first began. Very little is known about the Mongiki's oathing ceremony, and I have no idea of what to expect. It's alleged that new recruits wear their allegiance, and that betrayal or leaving the sect is punishable by death.
The young men behind me are just about to be baptized in the freezing cold pool just behind me. This will be the final part of their initiation into the Mongiki. Everyone that joins the movement must be initiated. When you are in the water, you vow never to sin again. And after you vow never to, to sin again, you start a new life, fresh. And what will happen now? What's the future now for these young men? Uh, people are, uh, are grouped into different units. Where will you train them now? Where will they go? We hold small, small seminars everywhere, mm. countrywide. Mm. Yeah. We want to build our people. We want to empower them economically, fast. They start right from the grassroots <coughs> in managing the affairs of their, the areas that they stay. And of course, the future, we, we have hopes that one day we shall make the government. The more time I spend with the Mongiki, the harder I find it to believe that the rumors and the accusations made against them are true. But there seem to be an overwhelming amount of people in Kenya who believe them to be true. So we need to find some people who actually have hard evidence about the decapitations, about the body parts being spread across the countryside, and about the fact they use fear and intimidation to take money off the poor people who they say they're here to protect. Back in Nairobi, I visit a slum that has lived with the Mongiki and seen the hope that they bring and the violence they hand out. His head en ended up there. Over here. Over there. I'm in Kenya investigating an organization called the Mongiki. Allegations against them range from murder to extortion. This is Mathari, four kilometers from the center of Nairobi. It's home to around 300,000 people and was once a Mungiki stronghold until they were brutally removed. I'm meeting up with Sami, who at great risk to himself, has agreed to talk about how the Mongiki operated here. Sami, can you tell me how the uh, Mongiki first came in to Mathari? They served a notice to anybody who was involved in crime. Yeah. And they said, if you are caught stealing or doing anything, you will face us. And what did they do with people who didn't listen to what they'd uh, threatened? Well, one morning people walked up and uh, there were four heads yeah. on that stretch over there. Up on the hill there were just four decapitated heads, yeah? Yes. It was a very strong statement that they meant business. Just, you know, in a span of about a week, there was no crime. This place was paradise again. Because the Mongiki policed it? Because the Mongiki policed it. Even the community appreciated the fact that they were here yeah. at that point. And the other thing was uh, they were the only people who had the nerve to steal electricity from the Kenya Power and Lighting yeah, and then supply down here. But, you know, you, you had to pay for it. Per bulb, you had to pay 300 just for one light bulb, Just 300 one shillings? Light, yes. What, a week or a month? That, that's a month. A month? Yeah. Then afterwards, they resulted to now asking people money for protection. If you have a house within the area that they, they, they were claiming to protect, you are forced to pay 30 shillings. Well, that's extortion, isn't it? It is. And it's extorting money from people who are incredibly poor, isn't it? It is. It is. What happened to people who crossed them? You, you know, they, they would abduct you. 
yeah. keep you for some time. Like one of the people who are, was abducted, I don't know how he crossed them, but his head en ended up there. Over here? Over there. That's where the head was. And his legs, you know, the, the lower part, was uh, not very far at the end of the, uh, of the village where it starts from this end. And his upper body torso, yeah. Yeah, was, was found at the end where Matare ends. And nearly a mile away from where his yes. head and his legs were yes, found. Yes, yes. So when this started happening, even the community now started asking themselves questions. Do we really want this? Well, the essence is that they started off, mm -hmm. and people believe they started off with good intentions. Yes. To police this area, mm -hmm. offering something the government didn't, re didn't didn't offer. Yes. But it grew ugly. Yes, it did. It did. The tension between the police and the Mungiki came to a head last year when two policemen were shot in the back and had their weapons stolen. The police retaliation for the murders was brutal. The police came now on a revenge mission. These were GSU. General service unit. Yeah. These are the bad guys. Oh yeah. boy, you don't want them. <laughs> The shooting started, the beating, everybody was asked you know, to come out of their houses if you were caught inside. Then they would beat you or shoot you. In a span of six hours, yeah. 35 people had been killed. The police killed 35 people 35 here. people. What, shot them? Shot them. They raped women around. The police were raping? Yeah. There so is what goes in the record. There is what doesn't go in the, in the record. It was horrific. It was horrific what happened. But the Mungiki caused this to happen, didn't it? They did, but Mungiki came because there was a gap. There's no way a government can ignore 300,000 people. And, you know, everything, you know, goes well. Somebody is bound to take advantage of the situation. All right, Sammy, yeah. if you heard that the Mungiki were coming back, yeah. Would you be pleased? It's tricky. Mm -hmm. They come with a face that says, uh, <laughs> but it takes time before you now start seeing the, the ugliness. Whether the Mungiki operating in Mathari were a splinter group or representatives of the organization as a whole, I just don't know. One thing that is for sure is that violence and fear was used to control the people here. And I'm still no closer to finding out whether the Mongiki are using their power for their own good or for the good of the people. Later that day, we hear some grim news. Yesterday at 3 p.m., uh, Miner and Jenga's wife, bear in mind, Miner's the head of the Mongiki. Minor and Jenga's wife and the driver were abducted. Uh, the driver managed to get a call out to his cousin, and the last thing that was heard from them was the driver pleading for his life. I met Virginia briefly ten days ago, and it's chilling to think that she's now gone missing. Another woman who is high up in the Mongiki is Florence. At one time, she was the most wanted woman in Kenya. I'm on my way to meet her at a secret location in Nairobi. Before joining the Mongiki, she was a prostitute for 15 years. Miner's wife disappeared yesterday, yeah, didn't she? The day after yesterday. Um, what happened? Even now I'm just here, I'm feeling, my blood is telling me they are dead. My blood is telling me. You think that they're yes, dead? Yes, I'm feeling. Who do you think is responsible for taking them away? This quick quick good. Quick quick. Yeah. The secret police. Yeah. They want to. They want us to feel pain so that we can leave Mugiki. But even if they take my baby and kill my baby, eh? I'll never go back. Never. You tell me actually what you do. I'm a coordinator of women. Do you target prostitutes? Yeah, yeah. I can change their life within 30 minutes. Really? Yeah. And what do you do to change their lives in 30 mm. minutes? I do read the Bible and tell them I was like you one day. I was mocking a very much bangy. 
Yeah, a lot of marijuana, yeah? Very much. And I've been jailed because of robbery. <laughs> I was even slaughtering girls. You were slaughtering? Yeah, I was a bad girl. Yeah. You killed people? Yeah. I was brewing Changa. It's very strong. Alcohol. Yeah, I was selling to people. Eh? And if you don't pay me, I could. I, I, I was taking with a glass and slaughter. I, I, can, you know, I can do everything to you. So everybody was fearing me in Kayole, Soweto. What about the claims that, you know, some of the girls that join have, uh, have female circumcision? Is that true? Yes, of course. Some of the allegations we heard were that people were locked up. And 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 and, help, and basically forced to have circumcision. Not forced. Right. No. Okay. It's your wish. Like now, uh, or April, uh, there is twenty girls. Twenty girls. Yeah, and they'll come to my house. How do you do it? Yeah, uh, there is an old woman. Mm. She will come with a knife, and then I'll take the legs of the girl, mm. and then I'll cover the neck like this. Please, please, please. Hold, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. And then the mama will just cut. Just a small thing. Just a very small thing. Some people might disagree with you that it's a small thing. But, uh, it's a small, a very small thing. Doesn't that mean that by taking away that very small thing, yeah. that she won't be able to enjoy sex in the future? That's lies. To be circumcised is a good thing because I can stay about three years without a man and I can survive. But uncircumcised girls can't stay. Because when that thing stands like this, you feel the yeah, end, you want a man. You can be fucked by everybody, even dogs. <laughs> we hear that the Mongiki go into the slums mm -hmm. and remove the pickpockets. How do they do that? It's just to tell you, if I'll see you one day, Pickpocket in here, I'll take off your head. So you have to fear, and you know. <laughs> yeah. So you so you threaten them, but yeah. you, but w would you do it? If I saw you, you see you pickpocketing, yeah, in my estate, I won't allow you. I won't allow you. I'll take you to my base. <laughs> base and then what? I, I, I'll beat you, or I'll tell you, and then if you will just hands up, I'll leave you free. What would happen? If someone killed minor, this Kenya will be bloodshed. It will revenge the whole world. Mombasa, Eldoret, Lamu, everywhere will burn these houses to hell. And I'll be in front. When you meet people with that kind of passion inside them, it's easy to see how that quickly come over spill into violence and she was just so forthright that kind of belief that kind of loyalty is open to manipulation I think when you've got people in an organization like that who are to intent and purposes brainwashed uh, I think that makes organization very scary Minor and Jenga's wife and her driver both went missing two days ago. We've just received a phone call from a leading member of the Mongiki to say that two bodies answering their description have turned up in the morgue. We're on our way there to find out if it's them. Florence's prediction has become all too true. As we arrive at the mortuary, her family and the Mongiki leaders are too stunned to talk. However, a relation of one of the dead told me all he knew. What had happened to the bodies? Do you know exactly what happened to them? From what we have seen, these people were tortured a lot because the bodies have got deep panga cuts. The hands, they are tied up, the, the legs were tied up. And we are, not seeing, we are not seeing it as if it's just uh, some ordinary criminal doing that. We are seeing as if maybe there was some information. Some people are trying to retrieve from these people. That's why they were torturing them. So we are seeing maybe there is a, another mightier power behind this kind of uh, uh, crime. Do you have any idea who those people might have been? Well, we don't want to speculate because it's too early. 
We don't want to spe speculate about it. Whoever is behind this, this is not, in, this is inhuman. It's inhuman. Whatever those people could have done. I mean, you just don't do things like that. How has Miner, how's Miner reacted to the news, do you know? Some of these things he doesn't know. Even, uh, even now, he doesn't know. So we don't know how he will react because he doesn't know about it. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you and your family. Two days later, Kenya awoke to the battle. The Mongiki took to the streets, setting fire to vehicles and blocking roads. It wasn't long before Nairobi was at a standstill and we were caught in the middle of it. What's happening, boys? What's happening? As we attempt to avoid the traffic jams, we turn down a slip road and run straight into the path of an angry mob. The Mangiki are rioting in reprisal for the killing of their leader's wife, Virginia. They're attempting to bring Nairobi to a standstill, and we've taken a shortcut directly into the path of an angry mob. Right, get in the car, get in the car, get in the car. There's a crowd there, and they're not fucking around, and they uh, are upset. The natural instinct is to turn and run, but as the mob get closer, I sense we're not the focus of their aggression. Hedging our bets, we decide to stand our ground. <laughs> 